information and uh, Pints with Peter on here along with uh, other information. Got about two more minutes before the presentation starts, so everybody be prepared. And again, please, uh, if you have questions, we're going to take questions at the end of this. Of course, if you have something that you're not sure of that you think of after the question and answer session is over, always feel free to call or email. Just a couple of technical things. Anyone? not able to see the screen that says Pints with Pete, not able to see our university site, are not able to hear me. Please, uh, please raise your hand. All right, so I'm assuming everybody can hear me and see the screen. As I say, if there is a problem, please let me know. I'm going to minimize the screen here. And again, what we have on, on the screen right now, this is our Unico University. This is uh, the landing page for it is unicosystem.com forward slash training. And as you can see, there's a number of training presentations available to you all the way from very basic introduction to a com comprehensive class. And a comprehensive class will give you an additional four years warranty. If you take the class, you pass all the tests and get 80% or more. So again, I know there's a lot of people that uh, may not be able to make the meeting live. That's not a problem. We have this all recorded right here. So. Take a look at this. Uh, this also lists some upcoming schedules for us. Next month we're going to talk about changing motors and wheels, a very popular topic. Uh, then talking about change, selecting a condensing unit for your air handler, talking about condensate, charging the system, etc. So uh, be a pretty interesting schedule from now to the end of the year. And it's now straight up 3 o'clock central time, so I'm going to start the meeting off officially. And again, Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. This is Pete Williams from Unico, and this is April's edition of Pints with Pete. And today's class is called the ABCs of PCBs. Now, a dumb thing, a PCB is a printed circuit board. That's what PCB means, printed circuit board. It's a very common industry term, but sometimes we, we forget that not everybody understands the acronyms that we use. So, little history, the first Unico systems had no PCB. There was no control other than a thermostat that would turn the system on or off. So that's what we had up until 2003. In 2003, we had a rheostat, which was not technically a PCB, but the rheostat was the first item that we had that would allow the user's control over the Unico system. After that, we came out with the Advanced Control Board. Now, the Advanced Control Board came in two versions, version 1 and then later version 2. And uh, the ACB was in a step forward. It used a printed circuit board to control a two-speed PSC motor. Then in 2010, uh, the April of 2010, so that'll make this exactly four years, we came out with the SMART system. The EC motor uses the SMART control board. So this was a big move forward. This gave us all the features and benefits of an EC motor. And later this year, it'll be a running change, so it'll probably be mid-year before the uh, uh, system starts showing up on your dock. But we are improving the SMART control board. We're going to be adding some features to that. Now, we didn't talk this year, uh, we don't have any schedules this year for Pints with Pete with the I-Series. I hope you're all aware of our new I-Series coming out next month. Uh, that has a number of PCB boards. And we'll be covering those in another Pints with Pete because that's a little bit outside the, the, the realm of what we have available to us here today. 
So the first one that we have, this is our standard motor. This is our STD2. Uh, it's a single speed, 1750 RPM, 240 volt PSC motor. Now what we have for it that a lot of people in customer service has told me this, a lot of people are not aware of this rheostat. And this is how the rheostat looks like in an electrical circuit. It's a, it's a rheostat that will allow you, and here's a picture of it. You can see the board right here. This can be mounted on the top or on the, on the side of the blower module. And this is what it looks like. Now, the idea with this is you would adjust this. You could adjust this to have the unit run constantly on ventilation speed. And then when it went from ventilation speed to full speed, it was very, very uh, notice, less noticeable. And so you got from 800 RPM, say, to 1750. Now that being said, you don't have to use this. You can turn this knob all the way to the left till you hear a click, and that shuts the board off. And that turns off the power for the motor until it gets a call from the thermostat. So, Again, the idea was you keep the fan running continuously at a low speed. Obviously, you could use that for fan. You could lose it for, for low heat with hot water coils. A uh, few instances it could be used for low cool, but mostly it was used for ventilation. Now, the advanced control board is no longer made, but there's many of them out there, so you should be aware of this. It was a move forward. It was a two-speed PSC motor. You had one speed for ventilation. You had another one for heating or cooling. Uh, the PCB board would control that to sort of emulate what an EC motor would do. In other words, it would have a soft start, soft stop. Um, so it was a move forward for us, but it was replaced in 2010 by the EC motor. When, and in our case, it is a true variable speed EC motor. This is what the advanced control board looked like. Uh, as I say, it's very in easily distinguishable by the LED lights that are flashing on it. This is where the control boards are all mounted. They're mounted in a box, or rather I shouldn't say mounted. They're all shipped to you from Unico in this cardboard box, which is inside of your blower. And this is version one. So again, there, there were two versions out there. The first one you can see right here, its distinguishing mark is it does not have a cardboard overlay. So uh, th these units, if you have one that fails on you, we will replace it. We do have replacement boards for this that will be slightly different. They will have a cardboard overlay. Also, the wiring was different with this. As you can see right here, you had a W, a W2, W3. Uh, later, that was redesigned so that you could run this on heating, on low speed heating for hot water coils. Now, the, the, as I say, the version 2 that we have out there, it has a cardboard overlay. Uh, the reason we did away with the version 1, it was again our first venture into the world of PCBs. They were affected by line voltage if you had a brownout situation. You could lose the software programming, and it was a pretty simple indicator. The light would change from flashing green to a solid green. All you had to do, and uh, I've done this myself, very simple. You shut the power off for about 30 seconds, and then you restarted it. That was all there was to resetting that. The newer units, version 2, and what we have today with the EC motors, are very robust units. And they can stand very large brownouts. So again, there's the version two. And what? There is the new wiring diagram right. with it. It's, it's a different mm -hmm. wiring configuration with this. And uh, uh, no. Mm -hmm. Note, if you guys could all put your phones on mute here, and then if you have a question that you want to ask, we can ask it on chat, or you can hit star six and unmute yourself. This is where we check the motor voltage. We would check the amp draw with the ACBs right here with this purple wire. This is what we covered last month and how to check airflow. 
So it was very easily distinguishable. You had a purple wire, you clamp your amp meter to it. This is the smart control board. This is the control board for our EC motor. As you notice right here, if you look at the power component, it's a very different power component. We don't need to clamp an amp to it. All that work is now done internally through the software. So that software determines the RPM of the system, uh, determines the CFM of the system based upon our fan curve, and it will automatically set the RPM. Again, the board itself has a number of features to it. You have a number of options that you can add with micro switches here. We do have a USB port connector, so if you have a computer, we supply you with the USB port to USB port connector and the software program. The software program will also be available online. This is what the smart board looks like. As you can see, it's a green board. It uh, is on the left here. You see EC motor on the left. That's our EC motor. And on the right, you have your PSC motor. Now, again, the EC motor we use is an Emerson Nidec motor, which is a fairly common motor. What is unique to it is the controller. That's the metal part at the base. That is programmed by Emerson to meet the Unical fan curve. So all this is being done through solid-state electronics. So as I say, if you have to, we can get the motor by itself or the controller can be separate. Um, this is going to use much less energy. Obviously, you're, it'll be very similar later when we talk about the I-series because it's sort of the same concept that inverters use. You're supplying just enough RPM to overcome the resistance of the system. So you're going to use about half the energy, uh, much quieter systems. And as you can see in this slide here, our biggest unit, our 5-ton unit set all the way at 1,250 CFM, is only drawing 488 watts. Now, by comparison, a toaster oven is about three times that. So it's a very, very energy efficient item. And it can be used with two-stage condensing units. We don't need the restrictor plate as we did on last month's class. We were talking about how we set the airflow with the uh, restrictor plate with the PSC motor. We check the amp draw. We don't need that anymore. All the work that the restrictor plate was doing is now done internally by the software or the program. Uh, we can operate on either 120 or 230 volts. It's a different wiring harness. And we allow you two ways to set the system up. You can use the default settings that come with it. Or, if you choose, you can program it with the PC laptop. This is what the board looks like. This is the PCB little board on its side. You notice in the lower right-hand side, this is where we connect our power supply. Either our 115 or our 230-volt power leads go into this. And then the board itself, if you notice, there's a couple of jumpers to point out on top. One is between R and OB, and that is used if you use it for cooling only. If you use it for a heat pump, you remove the jumper. Same as between Y1 and Y2. If we use this for a two-stage condensing unit, we'll take the, the jumper off. It's, if it's used with a single-stage condensing unit, we leave the jumper on. Now at the bottom, there's a jumper also in place for an aquastat. This is for use with a hot water coil for either a boiler or a water heater. Little notice right here on the left, you have the wiring harness for a one or for a 230 volt. On the right, you see one for a 115 volt. And as I say, the big thing I check for is to make sure that loop is there, because usually when I'm in the field, I'm hooking it up to a 115 volt supply. Uh, if you hook up 240 volt to a 115 volt supply, it's not good. Uh, same as hooking up 115 to a 240 volt motor. It's not quite as bad, but the motor doesn't work. So, getting back to the presentation here. This is your thermostat connections on the board. Very simple, industry common designations are 
OB for, for reversing valve, G for fan, Y1, Y2, etc. We also added accessory items to the PC. And in this case, we have uh, from left to right, we can hook this up. It's a dry contact for either controlling a chiller, a boiler, a valve, or a pump. That's a, that's a 250 volt dry contact. Then you have EAC. Now this is something that's going to be changing this year, but right now that is, an, that is a 115 volt sales switch for hooking up, say, an electronic air cleaner. And then we have a 24 volt control for either the humidistat or humidistat valve. And then finally we have the aquastat that you can use with your boiler so that it doesn't blow cold air when the system first starts up. Now, there is a two amp automotive fuse with this system. Back up a couple slides, you can see this, this fuse right here. We actually include a backup fuse right here in case you should ever blow the main fuse. There's a backup for you. If you blow the backup, well, you probably need to find out why it keeps blowing fuses, but this is a standard automotive two amp fuse. So they're very easy to find. Skipping ahead here, this is the big safety switch that we put on to our, our PC. Is this anti-frost switch that's labeled here AFS. What that does is it connects with spade terminals to either one or two freeze stats, which is our mounted into the coil module, that if they detect a buildup of more than an eighth of an inch of ice, what they do is they disconnect the power to the condensing unit and they, can, they prevent the condensing unit from slugging back liquid refrigerant to the compressor. Again, the main reason this comes on is there is an issue with airflow. There's a lack of airflow. Either they haven't changed the filter or, more commonly, not enough outlets were installed to begin with. Now, this is our Bulletin 3039 that you're looking at right here. This is our installation guide that comes with each and every advanced control board. This is a very complete guide. Uh, if you should ever lose it, we do have this all available online. But as you can tell, there's a number of ways that you can hook this thing up. Don't have time in this case to go through that, but we can hook this up for about 15 different types of applications. Uh, a couple things right here, as I say, this is uh, something that's very important with us. We use the same board for all of our models. This has been a big advantage to the Unico PCBs, is it's the same one for all of our air handlers. With that, though, you have to set the proper model. So if you hook this up to a 2430, right now you have to make sure that that switch is set to the right to where it says 2430. If for some reason you leave that switch to the left and it says 1218, it thinks it's a 1218 motor, and the motor actually runs backwards. Now, the switch you have on top is the default. You can set this for high, or you can set this for low. We'll show you the capacities in just a moment, but also on the PCB, there's a couple of LED lights that are very helpful in diagnosing this. The first light is the power light. As soon as you supply this with 24-volt power, the power light comes on. It flashes. Also, for just a second, a red light where it says heat will flash as well. Now, if you are running the system in heating mode, the light also comes on. The next light indicates the EC fan is at full speed. EC motors take about 45 seconds from the time they receive a signal until they reach full speed. So that's... Uh, that's a very easy troubleshooting light right there. The, the one at the bottom says PCB control. Uh, that is the most helpful of the PC, of the PC, the flashing LED lights on this system. What that does is it, first of all, would indicate uh, a switch that is marked on this as winter, which is now marked as air cycle. What this does is if you don't get a signal for eight hours, if it's being used strictly for cooling or heating, it will run the system on fan for five minutes. Now this is something we are making a change for later this year. The other reason the PCB light comes on, what you have to do now is take the switch that says AUX on one side and off on the other. 
You turn it to the left to aux, and now the PCB light flashes. And when it flashes, it's a long flash for 100 CFM, a short flash for 50 CFM. So it's very easy to check the airflow. You don't have to have a laptop. You can just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and if that is the case, we have 500 CFM of air. So this is our default settings. Again, for the 2430, we have a default of 500 CFM for low speed, 625 CFM for the high speed. Uh, the Y1, or the low cool speed, is 75% of whatever high speed is. Fan is 50%, etc. Now, if we have a laptop, we can do quite a bit of latitude in changing the CFM. We can have it as low as 200 CFM, in the case of the 2430, or as high as 750. Now, to protect the system, the motor will lock out at 1800 RPM. But you have to do a lot of things wrong to get it to 1800 RPM. Just the other day, we hooked this up with 30% fewer outlets than should be on, and it was still producing 400 CFM at about 1600 RPM. So that is a very uh, easily changeable item. This is how we connect it. We take the USB port, the USB port connector, hook it up to our laptop. We give you a software disk to use in your laptop. And it's a very simple program at this time. And this is something that we're going to be making changes to that I'll be talking about next. But the first thing you notice is the model number. Now remember, we wanted to set this system up for a 2430. We see 2430. The other ones do what they call gray out. Now, we program this by setting the high cool. So in the case of my classes, we set up a two-ton system for 400 CFM. We do that by typing in 400 to where it says high cool. Now, if you notice to the left, you have some check marks, some green check marks. This is the default settings. In other words, fan would be 50% or 200 CFM. Low cool would be 300 CFM or 75%. Now, if you choose to, you can override those numbers. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, when you first start the system up, you'll see that very slowly starting to gain RPM. They take about 45 seconds to do so. And that will tell both your RPM and your CFM. And again, the RPM will vary slightly. The system will be trying to overcome any resistance that's added to the system. Now, these are the changes we're making. This is a running change. I anticipate you'll start to see this midsummer. It's a software change and a chip. So the software upgrade, of course, is free. The chip will be a nominal price. And what we have with this are we have some new software features to it. Uh, again, now we have five systems. When we came out with this in 2010, we only had four. We still have one board control, all four sizes. You have a little bit better diagnostics with it. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see right here a representation of how the system is looking. Uh, you will have a more control over the air cycle. You'll be able to use it with a fresh air damper, and you can have it with a fresh air damper conform to the ASHRAE 62.2 standard. So some new menus we have with this. You have options, help, diagnostics. Uh, some new menus. We have the main menu that we had before. We have one for the air cycle. I'll get to it in a moment. And then later, one for the switches. And we list all the new models. Now we improve the air messages. Again, I have to be blunt with you. The main reason for air messages is there's a loose cable. That's all it comes down to. This will show you which cable it is that's loose. Uh, ASHRAE 62.2 is a, a problem that we're running into today with residential buildings as they're building them so tightly. You don't have air infiltration. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the term sick building syndrome in new construction and commercial. Uh, the ASHRAE 62.2 is essentially uh, bringing in fresh air for residential buildings. And this is what it looks like right here. This is the air cycle tab. There's two things we can do with this. We can set this to the automatic mode. Now to do that, you put in the square footage of your house, how many bedrooms, and how many occupants you have. If you prefer, you can set it by percentage of fresh air. 
If you go by the ASHRAE 62.2 standard, it will show you the CFM and the fresh air percentage. Now what we can do with that EAC switch, what was electronic air cleaner, now you can use that to control a fresh air damper, which is a third party item. Two ways to set that, you can set it for maximum comfort or you can set it for energy saver. Now if you're not using a damper with this, remember we had that cycle, that air cycle switch that would come on for five minutes every eight hours. Now we can set that to whatever our desired time is for whatever our desired mode is. Again, what I recommend doing, and I do this in my own house, is I run the fan on continuous fan circulation. So as you see, you've got some additional bells and whistles coming up with this. One thing we have here too, the switch tab. I just had a customer ask me last week, if I have the board closed, how can I tell if it's 2430 or, or 1218? Well, right now, the only way to tell if that switch is set to 1218 or 2430, if you don't have the software program, you have to lift off the board. The new software program will tell you what switches are set. So this displays all the board switch positions. So as I say, now we're going to be able to bring in fresh air. And uh, there'll be more changes as time goes by. As I say, we're just now getting involved with inverter technology, which is going to open up a whole new world of PCBs and uh, LED flashing lights and all that sort of thing. So that's my presentation there. I see we've got a couple of questions. All right, how did you become such an accomplished presenter? You're the best. God, Rich, you are one hell of a good guy. That's all I can say. Uh, any other questions we have out there? I'll take questions like that all day long. So as I say, a lot of the stuff that we have here kind of corresponds with what we did last month. It's sort of a continuation of that. Um, as I say, there's a, a lot of things that we'll be adding on to Unico. We'll be able to uh, put this on together with the I-Series uh, very shortly. Now, if you do that, you don't have it controlled by the computer. That is all done by the software as part of the outdoor unit. So, do we have any more questions out there? Okay, does the control board take the place of using the turbo meter to check the airflow? Ron, uh, no, I think of the control board as, think of that as the motor as the gross. So that tells you the gross. That tells you how many CFM of air you have being generated over the coil. You can use the turbo meter to, again, check, the, in this case, that would be the net. So you still need to get a turbo meter out there, see how much air you're actually delivering. So a very important question, very good thing with this. Bob, this is something everybody asks me on when I do the classes. Are we going to have a Wi-Fi or smartphone app sometime in the future? Um, i got to be blunt with everybody. It's a fairly expensive proposition to make an iPhone app, uh, a little bit more than we want to spend for what we get out of it, but that will certainly be something that we will have in the future. But uh, when, I can't tell you. All right, Lou, good question. Can you remove the jumpers when... Can you go over the jumpers when you remove W1, W2, Y1, Y2? Well, again, the jumper we have in there is between Y1 and Y2. That is your two-stage condensing units. Probably 95% of the systems sold in the United States, last I heard, were single speed. And what, what, they, what they have there is you'll leave that jumper in place. If you got a two-stage condensing unit, then you can take the jumper out and use Y1 and Y2. Is the AFS or auto reset? Lou, another question that uh, I'll have to tell you. With the AFS, the anti-frost switch, it's half, of the, it's half of the control. You have the anti-frost switch at one end, and then at the coil, you have one or two freeze switches. Now, these are bimetal freeze switches. And what happens is when they build up more than an eighth of an inch of ice, it disconnects the circuit to this anti-frost switch and shuts off the compressor. But it leaves the motor running. It leaves the fan running. So if you had a situation where somebody, say, is running their air conditioner when it's 70 degrees outside, uh, what they can do is just 
it'll be freezing up on coil, but nobody will notice it. But if you have a big block of ice because you only put in three outlets per ton, it's not going to do it. So you have to, uh, have to make sure that you get the right airflow. The 62.2 standard feature, will it integrate with an HRV as well as with the damper? Stuart, I have to say I'm a little bit unclear on how the ERV and HRV manufacturers control their systems. I would probably think that they have something of their own to do that, but if not, as I say, you don't have to necessarily use an HRV with this to get that ASHRAE 62.2. You could use it with a very simple scuttle vent. Again, just for you guys in the lower 48 states, the uh, uh, HRV and the ERV are the, essentially swapping out stale air inside the house for fresh air from the outside. And they have a very high rate of recovery. They have anywhere from 70 to 90 percent efficiency with them. Um, the ERV has a desiccant wheel with it that takes moisture out of it, so it's a little bit more expensive. The HRV, and Stuart, tell me if I'm wrong, it's basically by code in Canada, everybody has to have that. So again, I'm a little bit unclear because that's a third party item. If the distributor has an EC2, could we use the 110 volt harness to pigtail to power on the blower during a presentation? Well, Lou, all I can tell you, I'm not real good with changing around wires. The big thing is the difference between an EC1 and an EC2 is not only the wiring harness, but it's a different transformer. You got to have a different transformer to make it work correctly. They're simple to do. I mean, I've done them on training classes before. And believe me, guys, if I can do something, it's very simple to do. So yeah, as far as making the pigtail different, uh, you're getting into some small wires and soldering. And I'm not saying it couldn't be done, Lou, but it probably would be very difficult to do that. You're better off just taking a wire. I just take a wiring harness and a transformer with me because sometimes the distributors don't understand that we need a 115 volt motor. Okay, do we have any more questions out there? Again, I appreciate you guys giving up your Friday to come in and listen to me. Um, hope you found this to be interesting. Again, tell your friends about this. Uh, one more time, I'm just going to go back to our website. Are you referring to a step-down transformer? No, Lou, it's a different transformer entirely. Um, it, it's a, it's, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm not in the parts and customer service guys could probably tell you me a little bit more about that. But it is a, a transformer specifically made for our unit. The standard one has a 240 volt tap on it. This one has a 115 volt tap on it. So I, I want to uh, remind everybody this website that we can go to, unicosystem.com forward slash training, and you notice this has all of our training classes on it and all of the episodes of Pints with Pete, so that you can refer to this anytime you like. Try to keep these to about, uh, all about 41, 42 slides, so we can get this in in about 20 minutes. Okay, Lou, number one, my first question is to explain what a cardboard overlay is. Now, a cardboard overlay uh, it just makes it the wiring a lot simpler for the people out in the field. It prevents a short from happening with it. So that was something that, it, that was kind of an inside manufacturing question right there. But the cardboard was to prevent the, any 240 volt power touching our 24 volt supply. All right, well, I think we've got everybody answered. And as I say, if you have any more questions, make sure that you get those into us. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, our customer service department is here in St. Louis. You call 800 number, 800-527-0896. You get to talk to a live human being, and you get to talk to people that actually know the product. Uh, I have to say they probably know much more about Unico than I've ever learned in the 30 years I've been selling Unico. So again, thank everybody for coming in. We're going to conclude this month's Pints with Pete. So thank you. <laughs>